I think I, I'll begin this off. I have many, of course, uh, but on the most gen uh, general one, uh, how much did this diary change your image? I don't know where you see that in the, in the point of your research. How much do you think it changes the existing historiography after all of these debates as to whether it was legitimate or not? Uh, and uh, uh, within that, uh, uh, the, uh, I think, very interesting part of having first published it in Russian translation intrigues me. This sounds like the Posolsky Prakaz of the 17th century in which all documents coming into the center were only a authority when they were translated. But was this not commented on at the time about why one that didn't publish the original or, or they were playing games with what the original language would be in that? What do you see in that? I, I didn't see any, uh, any references to any debate about it being published in, uh, in Ukrainian versus Russian at the time. It, it just seemed, um, I mean, it came out in a, in a huge run. I believe it was 100,000 copies at the time mm -hmm. in 1990. Um, but I didn't see any mentions about why it would have come out in translation versus, I guess, just maybe to reach a larger reach audience, a larger audience within, in Russia. Yeah, yeah within, within Russia. Um, and uh, uh, we did have, you know, we do have the Kobzar versions, which were published in Ukrainian, although they weren't, uh, weren't working from the original. Um, in terms of how it's affected my, uh, my approach to the Mahnitshina, it's, I, I would say it's, it's become more and more important as I, as I work with it. Um, when I first came across it, uh, it interested me quite a bit because it had this, uh, it, it had uh, this description of a massacre of a German colony. And I believe it's really the only, the only description of a massacre of, of Germans from the Machnavist side. Um, Machno describes something that might be considered, but the way he frames it is not, not really a massacre. So this is really the only description that I've come across from, from that body of literature. We have lots of descriptions from the Mennonite side, um, but not from uh, the Machnavist side itself. And um, so that, to me, that was quite interesting. Um, in terms of my interpretation of the movement overall, um, how I've started to see Kuzmenko in relation to it is sort of representative of a layer of the Machnevshin. And I think this is something that, this is something that I'm, I'm working on and, and, and trying to emphasize is that the movement itself was quite varied and layered. It wasn't, some people try to present it as predominantly anarchist, right, or predominantly um, one, one or the other, or, or as a criminal, sort of a criminal bandit movement and that. So you have these, these different interpretations of it, but according to me, it's, it's less one or the other, and it's, you have these layers. And Kuzmenko is part of one layer that has, a little, has more of a, a pro-Ukrainian culture to it, and so it makes it so that it's not contradictory to the movement because some there's been some interpretations that the movement was contradictory to the to a Ukrainian cause right that they bumped up against each other um, but I would see that there was a layer within the movement that was quite involved in promoting Ukrainian language Ukrainian culture um, as I showed with that sample Schlacht Voli, that was a uh, Ukrainian language newspaper that was published by the Machnavists um, so I think that Kuzmenko actually is quite representative of, of uh, a certain layer within this movement, and that, that's how I would say that it would, it's mainly affected my, my interpretation. Richard, yeah. And then... Yeah. And secondly, you mentioned when your her diary enter, entry describing the Mariupol massacre, you said she was a right to numb detachment. I mean, what what gives you that impression? Uh, okay, the with the recruited, yeah, I per, it's it's interesting you caught on to that because I purposely used a, a term that was a little bit more vague because it's it's unclear whether they were they were part of forced labor 
or if they voluntarily went because they were suffering. In so in the interrogation, it the way that she frames it and the, the words that she used suggests that it was voluntary, but we do know that there was the forced labor right as well. So. Um, so it's a, it's a bit unclear at this point, right, whether it was forced or, or completely vulnerable or sort of a combination of both, right? Um, and then in terms of the, yeah, the numb detachment, I just felt that the, the kind of uh, describing such an extreme uh, event as this, this massacre in which, you know, she says that people were killed, even women were killed in this, and then, and then immediately after this kind of like walk down by the, by the river, and, and I think they, they talk about eating there, having, having some food or something, and, um, and then this kind of laying, there's a corpse laying there, and she doesn't really reflect at all on what had just happened, right? And I feel that the, it seems as though the, the sort of emotionality comes out later in the following entry around this, this horse that she sees that's, that's drowning in, in muddy water, right? And that, that becomes a very emotional entry that she gives, right? And it's just this, it's a strange contrast, right, between um, not really ref reflecting on this human suffering, but then with the horse and that, and, and really going on for a long while on this. So that, that was sort of where I was coming at from, from reading that. And numbness is the right word for that? Yeah, you could absolutely choose different words, yeah. Okay, then online we have from Shelby Shapiro uh, two questions I'll put together. One is, uh, did she have any interactions with Trotsky? And then a more general uh, question of, did she have interactions with Nabat? Mm. Uh, I don't know of any situation in which she had uh, contact with Trotsky. Um, but with Nabat, absolutely, she would have been involved in it, because Nabat was, was heavily involved in the movement. Uh, they sent many of their, their activists, and there were many anarchist intellectuals from the cities that went to Huleb Pule, and so she would have been uh, interacting with them probably on a daily basis at, basis at certain point. Uh, as I mentioned, Volin was, he was part of Nabat as well, so uh, she was quite, she, was, she knew him quite well throughout her life. Then uh, from Yaroslav Kovalchuk, can we assess to what degree feminism was a part of the Maknavist movement based on Helena's uh, diary? I think that's very difficult to determine. Um, there's just simply not much information on, on women in the movement and that we have very few accounts. Um, and, it's, and it's also con conflicting in terms of how women were treated, right, because we have many, many accounts of Machnavis raping women, but then again, we also have these, you know, like the, the commission that she was part of, right, which would also execute insurgents for, for rape. So it's a very contradictory uh, legacy there. And um, I wouldn't necessarily take what Helena, her personal interests, and, you know, her discussion with Goldman to be representative of anything beyond that, other than sort of uh, more gen general, generalized interest in women's rights that, that, w that was happening in anarchism at the time. Okay, and then adding to this uh, by Oksana Dutko, excellent talk. Thank you. Could you tell us a bit more about other women in the Maknavist movement? Yeah, as I mentioned, there's very, very little information on women in, in the movement. Um, there is uh, another another woman um, who was closely related to, to Makhno, uh, Marusia uh, Nikiforovna, uh, who led her own detachment of anarchists. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been some very good work done recently on her life, although uh, none of the sources that I'm aware of, like we, we have from her voice, so it's all stuff that's, that's written by her or from memoirists and, and uh, from more detached sort of archival documents. Um, but she is a very interesting character uh, as a woman leading a detachment uh, in, in the Civil War. Um, she at times was, 
sort of written about as, as almost as, as more wild than Machno himself. And there was all kinds, also with her, all kinds of strange rumors, rumors that she was uh, hermaphrodite and, and all this, or that she was actually uh, a man and all, all these, these kind of rumors that, that tied into gender. Um, so there's that. Uh, there was also uh, a woman who served as a nurse within the movement that was interviewed, I believe, in the 80s. And uh, you can find, you can actually find a uh, videotape of this interview with her. She doesn't mention so much from her time in, um, in I believe, what was her name again? Uh, Leah, Feld, Leah Feldman, I believe. Um, she, but she does mention something about the accusation that Machno uh, was involved in, in sexual assault and that, and she sort of responded to that as, but how, when would he have ever committed these crimes? Uh, his wife was always nec riding next to him. And um, so that, that was like her main, it's kind of her main commentary on, on the movement was, was related to the sexual violence. Um, but really, other than that, we don't have much, much information on, on how women were treated or their role within the movement. Um, there were some female uh, intellectual anarchists that did that, that did participate in the movement, um, so we have that. But yeah. Okay, then I'll. I'll one, okay, I'll let myself then have a, another quite a go on it. Uh, I find very interesting uh, Emma Goldman's calling her a peasant. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, I think we've got another issue of observation of class and social status and. Uh, you know, preconceived notions that Emma Goldman brings with her. Obviously, this woman, whatever her original birth background, was not to our mind a peasant at the point she reaches Emma Goldman. Mm -hmm. uh, but that also then may involve us with some of the discussion of the so called intelligence or ideological leaders of the movement and their attitudes towards the Machniewczy. Uh, as well as ethnicity and religious issues mm -hmm. of suppositions of how Jews saw the movement, how Mennonites saw it, how, how, how Ukrainians saw it. I wonder if you want any more thoughts on this, and is it a more generalized issue of problems? I mean, if we had just had that one phrase, we would have picture a very different woman than you've told us about. Yes, yeah, that, yeah that's, that's a very good observation because obviously you know where where she was born, her education. She, it's interesting because yeah, Goldman calls her a peasant, and yet others considered her an intellectual. Others who who knew her better. Um, I think it does come down to this Goldman, you know, coming from New York and all these big cities and that right, and this and and of a Russian background and sort of perceiving perceiving. Kuzmenko as a, a, a kind of backwoods peasant in southern Ukraine, right? And it's this, this sort of image that's, that was circulating at the time, right? Um, and in terms of the intelligentsia, it's um, most of them were coming from either a Russian or Jewish background that worked with the movement. And so they, in, in the literature, they're quite critical. They're critical of um, they're, they're critical of the, the army for at, at, diff at different periods for their violence, for what they call anti-Semitism that was spreading within the movement, um, and, and just sort of generally not knowing enough about ideological anarchism. And whereas Machno and Arshinov, who Arshinov could, could conceivably be considered an intellectual, um, they said that we have to work with what we've got here. Right and yes, they're not perfect. Um, there are problems in the movement, and that's why we want the intellectuals to come to us. We want to bring them into the movement, and they can propagandize amongst uh, peasant members within within the army. Um, but, to in terms of Nabat, they while they they did issue these warnings about sort of um, anti-Semitism and violence within the movement, they also did remain allied with the movement throughout the Civil War, although there were, there were quite uh, large tensions at various, at various points. Um, 
later in, in exile, some of the Nabat members uh, were very critical of the movement. Um, for instance, Mark Murachny, who, mo who moved to the, immigrated to the United States, and uh, he wrote uh, some cr very critical uh, stuff about, um, about Mahno and about, about uh, alleged anti-Semitism. So. Yeah, and then maybe anyone else will jump in if I, uh, I, I don't want to take over. Uh, I, maybe a, a, a little bit of a pushback on where she's seen in the history of the Ukrainian revolution and Ukrainian events. I mean, if we think of the Ukrainian revolution and women, Western Ukrainians have Olena Stepanovna from the siege rifle and the heroine of the independence struggle. Is the, the first name will come to if you turn to most Western Ukrainians and talk about women in the national cause. I am stumped, and maybe somebody else, Victor or someone, can come up with it, if you turn to the Ukrainian People's or National Republic and said, come up with one woman who is uh, important in the military or state building structure. I mean, you have in the pre-period all the importance of women as the builders of Ukrainian consciousness, the Lesha Ukrainkas, you know, the uh, Kobyanska, but maybe I'm overlooking someone. As close as you can come to it in certain ways is Helena Kuzmenko, who gets maybe fallaciously uh, not a bad reputation from a number. I mean, there are those that were very negative, but there were those who, like Irchan, discussed her intelligence, her goals, whether there were or were not relations with the Petlura's army a considerable number of people associated with the Ukrainian National Republic believed that she was carrying on those influences. So she comes out, uh, strangely enough, and is an activist, and uh, the plot against Makhno, whether it occurred or did not occur, of course, puts her in uh, the category of closer to uh, a national heroin. I'm, that's going too far, I know, on, on, on doing it. I think there would be those who uh, would look at this later uh, who would find now the diary extremely, from the Ukrainian point of view, disappointing. That mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, someone who, who is remembered as uh, showing that there was Ukrainian national spirit in those areas and that it was a woman who did it. Uh, so uh, I wonder if you would want to comment any more on that, see that is going too far, uh, and... Uh, it's, yeah, I find the, as you, you were mentioning, the how she became known as sort of a, a pro-nationalist, right, or, or sympathetic to the nationalist cause, right? And it's interesting how that developed, and that would made her, make, make her look more positive um, from, from a pro-Ukrainian position, but from the Soviets, right? They were sort of spreading these ideas in their literature that she was actually yeah. uh, a national, so sort of to try and create the, her an image of her as a betrayer of the cause and to delegitimize, right, delegitimize the movement by Makhno's own wife having been this kind of treasonous character within it. And also in uh, one of the, in Tepper, who, who was one of the, the writers that, that sort of talked about this pro-nationalist slant to uh, Kuzmenko, he, he explicitly says that she introduced uh, Russophobic and anti-Semitic slogans into the movement, and um, which of course is completely untrue. The Machnevists um, never adopted any, any kind of ethnic chauvinist uh, slogans, and they were constantly battling against anti-Semitism. But it was, it was also, Tepper was kind of using this to, to tie like this a pro-Ukrainianism with, with Russophobic and anti-Semitic themes, right, to create this kind of monster image of her. So I find it's interesting how the different, different sides and the different forces are constructing these different narratives and they, and they operate differently, right, depending on who's telling it and how they're 
receiving this information. Yeah, and it, it all mattered. The revolt that they're charged with in Poland made Makhno a bit of a hero to the Ukrainian diaspora in North America. Right? So uh, it, it, yeah, I think uh, interestingly on that. But back to the family, uh, we have again from Shelby Shapiro, you noted that she and her daughter died. What did the daughter do? What was the daughter's life? The daughter, um, she struggled quite a bit. Uh, there's some letters between uh, Kuzmenko and her daughter when Kuzmenko was still in, uh, in, in, in the uh, labor camp and talking about you know, not being able to make enough, not being able to find jobs. Uh, Yelena only did a couple interviews in her life um, but yeah, she does talk about how she was sort of blacklisted from, from many different jobs as a result of her father being Mahno. So um, from the information that we have, she suffered quite a bit as a result of that. And, and she also mentioned that she couldn't care less about politics. I, I think that the, that experience kind of made her not even want to know about it. She said talks about how she doesn't even really know about her father's activities and all this, so it sort of created this distancing from anything political. Okay. So do we have at this point questions? Okay, then I, I will only give myself one more, and this is, this, and sorry for this, I'm not making this into a dialogue, uh, uh, but when, when it was done. I'm curious what, uh, not to this work specifically, but to your book, the reaction you have gotten in anarchist circles. Uh, and then I will uh, let myself another personal, uh, maybe a bit strange. Yes, you know, when I am writing in 1970 the seminar article, anarchism is extremely alive. Kon Bendi. Daniel Kohn-Bendy is very important. All kinds of uh, people are involved, 60s people into anarchism, uh, and uh, there are going to be re reactions from them. Uh, what I'm going to write is, of course, the last thing that they are interested in, and yet uh, I get a whole influx of, of people writing to me wanting more information on anything I could provide. And just to, to show the difference, this Schlag der Wolle, which Sean mentions, there were, there were no copies available anywhere in the West at that time. And there were only five, or and then I think maybe 11 at the end, copies of the Russian language newspaper that you could put your hands on. Mm -hmm. So just to show where the world was on what, what you could know on it. So I'm curious now, when you, when you did do, do both Mennonite and anarchist narratives. What's the anarchist reaction then to your book and work? Yeah, uh, overall it's been very, very positive reaction. They're quite interested in the research and and the, the different sources that I've been finding, um, particularly any any newspaper sources and, and that. Um, and uh, I I gave a presentation at the L.A. Anarchist Book Fair uh, recently, so. Um, they seem to enjoy uh, the Sam Dolgoff Institute as well in Chicago, which is uh, anarchist. They, they asked me to do a presentation. So overall, there's been, been quite a bit of interest from various different groups, like anarchists, Mennonites, Ukrainians, and that. So, yeah. Since you brought up the, uh, the 60s and 70s, I think you had a... Louder, please. Uh, what, what, what can you tell us? Noam Chomsky, Chomsky is a yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk quite a bit about him, so think about him. I, 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 of him. Yeah. I think told him that he might do his work. Because uh, yeah, Noam Chomsky is also one of, one of the Muslims who was with the Muslims. Yeah, it, I, I think that, especially from the, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, like, within anarchist literature, they, they see the Mahnavist movement, this would be Chomsky as well, right? They sort of see it as this practical implementation of anarchy, one of the rare moments in which an anarchist system was, it was attempted to put it in place, right? I, I think, in, in my opinion, I mean, yes, the movement was, was led largely, although not entirely, by, 
uh, anarchists, and they were operating from trying to carve out these territorial spaces in which to conduct anarchist or what might be broadly called libertarian socialist experiments, right? So in that way, it is this kind of living example as opposed to just propaganda, paper, writing, right? And I think that's what is especially attractive to people. Um, the extent to which these, exper these experiments were able to, to, to sort of flourish and, and, and really be carried out is questionable. Because um, the, the territory that they controlled was just constantly being interrupted by, by the Civil War and different forces taking this and that. And even when they took these large cities in 1919, I mean, they were being bombarded daily, right? So it's, um, as a practical example, I think it's worth looking at uh, as to what was being done. Although I think that some of the literature in the past overemphasized and e exaggerated kind of some, of some of what was going on there. Okay, so if there are no other questions, the only thing I will say is uh, when Sean brought up the problems of the documents in Hoya y Polya, uh, we've got to understand how important this research is and all the material that he's gotten out so far. I mean, we have no idea, you know, what the fate of the Hoya y Polya buildings, archives, historical museums will be. Uh, you know how how full this destruction uh, of what they are carrying on. Is there any now? I mean, as they are tearing down whole the more monuments throughout the occupied territories, and uh, you know destroying Ukrainian books and doing other things, have you gotten any indications of what the Putinite lunacy thinks about Makhno and this movement and? Uh, any statements at all, or is that aside from their issues now as they're too busy fighting neo-Nazism? I, yeah. um, I, I I, there's not much that I've seen, but what I have seen is that earlier on, even some of the, uh, s some of these so-called separatists in, in Donbass, that they, they were adopting Makhno's heritage, and there was even a, I believe there was a unit that was named after Makhno, and there was, you know, there's, so there's sort of drawing on that heritage as well, right? Um, but as, as the war has evolved, it's become more very decidedly that the Makhno's heritage is being integrated into the Ukrainian army, and, and, more, and there's more interest from the Ukrainian side. And uh, as we were talking about, that there was recently that mural in Zaporizhia that of Makhno on the side of a building, and then it has the black anarchist flag crossed with the uh, Ukrainian national flag. So, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at, at that. Yeah. Okay. In the old revolution, where every world revolution used to conduct propaganda, it was called Anna Brazil Zaporizhia during the insurrection. Oh. And it was Makhno and that prevent <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I, I, and we have a question from Heather Coleman. Uh, can you talk a bit more about the diary as an ego document? What seems to be its purpose for her? Is there an addressee? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. She did talk about, um, so when she explained that she did have a diary, she also explained that she was tasked by Makhno to to uh, have a diary for, uh, to, to make a history of the movement. And then she, I believe in another, in, in another interview, she talks about having given some of her diaries to Arshinov, who Arshinov um, actually wrote the sort of first history of that movement, and, and he was an important, uh, an important ideologue within the movement. So there was that at least ostensibly, there, there is this audience for, like, for the creation of a history. Um, but as you read the document, it's very clear that she's also working out some of her emotions in, in there, and, and that it's all, it becomes a document for, for herself as well. Um, because, you know, the, the, particularly that last uh, entry where she talks about wanting to run away with her friend and, and that Mahno tells her, you know, if you leave, you're not my, I won't, I'm not your husband anymore. Um, that doesn't seem like the kind of thing that would be put
put into uh, the type of more propagandistic history that the, that Arshinov was w w eventually did make. And in fact, in Arshinov's history, he doesn't mention her at all, except for one footnote in which he says the diary's fake. So um, that's also interesting. But yeah. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank you for a very interesting presentation, and thank you. Thank the audience. Yeah.